Hello and welcome to our monthly interview with the mayor of Lansing, Andy Shore. I'm Burl Schwartz from City Pulse here at the Message Makers studio in Old Town. Andy, good to see you. Good to see you, bro. And well, this is a twofer. This is our July and August <laughs> right. interview. We'll be back in early September, but a lot to get to, including a press release I just received from your office about uh, uh, the next step to help address the city's legacy costs. Uh, these are the uh, unfunded liabilities for pensions. Correct. Uh, so as I understand it, uh, you're uh, going to limit uh, mayoral s future hires of mayoral staff and non-bargaining employees uh, starting uh, next week, mm -hmm. August 1st, uh, to define contribution retirement plans Correct. instead of defined benefit plans. Right. What's the difference? What does that mean? Um, in essence, those any new employees that come in that are mayoral or non-bargaining will come in with a with a four hundred one k instead of a pension plan, um, and it's you know it's it's kind of a twofer. One, it, it assists with legacy costs because we don't have to to worry about the unfunded pensions. This is not going to add to the unfunded pensions that the city has. Um, two, these positions, uh, along with department directors, which I'll get to in a second. These are, are not necessarily you know, 25 year positions. You know, people who come in and work for the mayor are not gonna be here for you know, a 25 year pension position. So it's portable. A 401k or defined contribution is portable. An employee can come in, um, there are contributions made from the city and from the employee towards that retirement, and they can take it with them when they go somewhere else. You know, I, don't, I don't know that I'm gonna be here 25 years, nor am I gonna have a staffer with me for 25 years. So um, if they're not here, you know the you know the full time, depending on the the bargaining unit, fifteen or twenty five or whatever it is. If they're not here um, for the full time, then they would just be cashing out their defined benefit anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a benefit for employees. We've talked to several employees who've said that they thought it would be a benefit, um, and it doesn't increase the uh, the legacy cost um, for the city. Again, we're going to do it to any new mayoral staffer who's hired, uh, any new non-bargaining, which is uh, kind of senior leadership. There's maybe 25 or so non-bargaining positions in the city that are kind of senior leadership in departments. Uh, and then we are going to propose this for department directors who are in what's called the executive management plan, but we can't do that on our own. We're gonna send that to council for their consideration and passage. And again, you know, department directors, they, they may or may not be here long-term, but, um, but we believe that department directors coming in should also have the defined, defined benefit or, um, I'm sorry, department directors that come in should have a defined contribution when they start, uh, again, so they can take it with them and that, so that we're not increasing legacy costs in the, the senior leadership. So this is not the, the union positions. It's not you know, collectively bargain positions. These are mayoral and, um, and non-bargaining uh, and small department number. directors. Yes, so it's it, a relatively small number. So this makes maybe a tiny dent in the problem. Correct. What do you, what's... Uh, <laughs> What's the answer to uh, making a big dent? Uh, we are in negotiations with our, our unions to look at um, how we can move forward with, um, with things that are good for employees and good for the city. Um, you know, a lot of our, our um, legacy cost issues are, are retirees, and there's only so much you can do with retirees. Um, so we're, we're making progress. We believe we're making progress. It's, it's not something where you, um, you fix the problem in, in day two. You know, the, the problem has been rising over years. We're at about $700 million in, in, um, in unfunded. And in essence, we have to kind of peak it and then stop it from getting higher. Um, and that's what we're working on. We're working on as new employees come in, um, how can we change systems and, and work with our, our unions to make sure that we are not making the problem worse. Um, and you know, Who it's, actually uh, negotiates with the union? Uh, the administration. We have uh, Nick Tate is our union negotiator. We have a team of Nick Tate and, uh, and our HR director, our finance director, and then depending on the union, um, other senior leadership, they negotiate as we do contracts. And we are in negotiation with several of our unions right now for their, the next contract. The only one we have finalized up till now is um, Teamsters 214, which is the supervisory employees of the city that are not police and fire. Um, so we, you know, we're working with them to, to make sure that, um, that, again, the employees are getting properly compensated, um, and yet we're not increasing the liability. And, and just so your viewers know, you know we're, not, we're not shirking our duties for the, the dollars that we're owed, that are owed to retirees, but 
um, you know, in our budget last year, we had to put you know, 45, 50 million dollars in um, to pay off the, the unfunded part of our pension system. So it's a cost that we pay due to commitments made to employees in the past. And um, you know, they're not able to put in enough money to make the, the pension system self-sufficient. So the city has to put in dollars that, that are not being used for other services. Again, we do it because we have to pay the obligations to our employees, our pensions are constitutionally guaranteed, and we've got health care benefits that we have committed. Um, we just don't want to exacerbate the problem, so we are working with our, our labor unions to, um, to make sure that new employees as they come in are not, uh, we're not going to exacerbate the problem. All right. I want to move on to development. Sure. Uh, so we've got, on the one hand, <laughs> uh, the Block 600, uh, gr uh, ground's been broken. We mm -hmm. see active building uh, efforts. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, for our listeners, that's where the Marriott Courtyard and the Meyer Urban Market uh, uh, will go, as well as some apartments. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, nothing, and I drove out there this morning, uh, nothing's going on at Red Cedar mm -hmm. uh, visibly. Correct. And, and we even have a billboard for Block 600 I passed We do, I morning. saw it today, yeah. Uh, uh, block 600, as far as the public role in that, started a lot later than Red Cedar. What? Why can't we, why isn't Red Cedar off the ground already, so to speak. Well, keep in mind, Block 600 started later, but it finalized a lot earlier. Um, we, we finalized the, you know, the, the grocery store um, and all the other pieces, the grocery store, the hotel, and the housing. Block 600, again, for your viewers, is 600 Michigan Avenue. Right. We finalized that several months before we finalized Red Cedar. Um, we finalized the brownfield plan that we were going to do. They were also able to go to the MEDC and get their project finalized uh, in terms of the state pieces. Um, so we have now finalized Red Cedar, um, and they have to go to, to the state, and they have to get their pieces from the state, and I believe they're still working on that. So we finalized it, but they haven't finalized the whole financing package. Also, remember that when we do a, a brownfield with them, it's reimbursement. Um, so they have to finance these, the project up front. So they have uh, investors and others that they are engaging and have been engaged to, um, to, to put together uh, what's called the the capital stack, the you know the the dollars that they're going to get put in um, before they can actually start work. They they've got the commitments from the city now with city council passing our brownfield. They have to get their commitments from the state, and once they've got all the dollars and their investors, once they all the dollars are collected, then they can start moving. And then you know years later, after it's up and and they're generating taxes, then they get reimbursements from the city. So they have to they have to collect their financing. We think you know we're hopeful. In the fall, it could be in the spring when um, you know when the vertical work starts. But uh, but they have to they have to get their financing in place. And and um, I, my guess is they're they're still working on that. I've had some communication with um, with the the folks who are running Red Cedar. And again, I think that they're still working with the state to to finalize what the state's going to be putting in as well. I, I spoke to uh, the, the project director this morning who said they may have a tentative date. He's trying to confirm okay. that. But yep. uh, uh, shouldn't they have had their financing in place? They've got they've had this project uh, on the front burner for years Well, but now. It, I mean, it kept changing. You know, the, the different pieces kept changing. And um, I think they've had, they've had Conversations with people who they believe were going to finance it, but um, until they've got until they understand they've got the reimbursements, until they get the brownfield plan, um, you can't finalize with with banks or or other lenders until they understand how they're going to to in essence recapture their investments. So you know, you can make outreach and contact, but we work with lots of developers who come in and they talk about things and they say, you know, I I can't get financing if this or I can if this. So a lot of times the financing depends on. Um, on the capitalization of the project and the brownfield plan and the, the um, community revitalization program, the CRP dollars from the MEDC is part of the capitalization of the plan. So you can have outreach, but um, sometimes the bank won't give you the loan until they understand how you're going to pay back that loan. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, what comes first, the chicken and the egg? You should be, they should be outreaching to everybody, but sometimes, a lot of times the financing comes at the end. Uh, the, but uh, Pat Gillespie had to deal with all those mm -hmm. things. Oh yeah, and after he got done, after we passed our brownfield, he went to the MEDC, um, and you know he again he had uh, commitments for financing which he didn't finalize until after he had um, finalized with the city and finalized with the MEDC. 
Um, and yeah, he moved, he moved pretty quickly uh, to, to lock down the financing that had been committed to him. And, uh, and I think the Red Cedar folks are, are doing that as well. Again, I don't know where they are at with the state and if they've been approved through the state, so that could be the delay, but I, I don't know that off, uh, offhand. All right, update us, if you will, on the uh, City Hall development proposed development project, uh, where do things stand with? Uh, still trying to figure out how we're gonna pay for the uh, the court and the lockup relocation. Do you still, we have lots of, of ideas that we're batting around. We've had people who've approached us, you know, uh, uh, there's not a lot changed because it's still, it's still the, the issue of if we, you know, if we were to get out of City Hall and, and give it to, to Paul Beitler, or sell it to Paul Beitler, don't know why I even think we're giving it away, <laughs> sell it to Paul Beitler, um, you know, we, we think there's about 30 million or so in tax increment financing we can recapture by giving, putting a brownfield plan down and capturing it ourselves. And that can fund um, very likely moving City Hall, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't address the costs of creating a new lockup uh, and moving the courts. So we are still looking at a variety of different um, ideas and, and we're, until we can figure out how to pay for it, we're not pulling the trigger, and in the meantime, you know, we're we're putting band-aids on, on the problems that are going on in City Hall right now. You you did the expose several months ago now, which we were happy to have you do to show the public the problems of City Hall, but um, but we have to be able to pay for it, and I don't know that that people are ready right now for you know any kind of a ballot issue or millage. Plus, we're basically at our millage cap, so we we really can't go out for that. So we have to we have to work on um, on how. You know, if we can find a property that's that's cheaper, and then we can incorporate um, uh, we can incorporate uh, courts and lockup in with the with the costs, we have to make the numbers work. And and uh, until we can make the numbers work, we can't finalize. Yeah, that segs actually into another development question. Uh, as we uh, reported this week, uh, uh, the public seems to support the idea of a performing arts center yes. uh, the, by a large margin, <laughs> unscientific study, but the numbers are so big yeah. that uh, they do indicate the public uh, would support it. But uh, it, it's uh, it going to be a 40 to $60 million project to do it mm -hmm. uh, properly. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's uh, the people who um, are questioning the ability uh, to raise uh, anything close to that privately. Uh, and so that then uh, leaves the question of, it, it, you know, if you're having problems with millages or that concept for City Hall, what, what are we going to, uh, how are we going to pay for Performing Arts Center? It'd have to be a public-private partnership. Um, I mean, City Hall, like I said, we can, we can tiff that property and probably get, I mean, snapshot in time, 30, you know, $30 million over the future uh, in terms of, of revenues, in terms of increased taxes. The Performing Arts Center, we're going to look at the same ideas. Can, we, can the city put 40 to $60 million in? No. No, we can't. And if it's, if it's the city of Lansing must put 40 to $60 million in order to have this regional Performing Arts Center, well, that's not going to happen. But the city, but, the city might have to put twenty to forty million. I, and I don't after private. I don't know funding. if we have that capacity. We have to see what capacity we have. Again, if if we're looking at um, if we can do a brownfield and we can um, uh, put in you know tax increment finance based on future capture, um, we'll look at that. We will absolutely look at those numbers, see what the city could do ourselves for reimbursements for for um, eligible activities. But a performing arts center has to be. An entire community affair. It's got to be a capital campaign. You know, the um, the folks working on that will be looking at that. They'll be looking at you know a fundraiser feasibility. Pe people think all kinds of things. Some people think we can raise sixty million dollars. Some people think we can't. You know, it's all anecdotal. We are we have our feasibility study going on right now for um, what the region needs in terms of a performing arts center, and we think that shows or that will show that there is a need, and there will be kind of a, a fundraising feasibility uh, also that's performed. We have very good fundraisers here. We have a lot of people who would like to see this and are willing to, to put their money where their mouth is. We've got um, individuals, we've got businesses, we've got you know great companies that um, we think will be willing to put in. And we're going to, you know now that we've got, at least are going to understand soon the feasibility of the need, we will know the feasibility of what we can raise. Again, the city has, has some small piece of it, that you know, I think we will be willing to do um, 
as it as it as the uh, the locations get finalized and things like that, uh, I think we will have the ability to do some of that based on again future tax revenues that are baked into the plan. Because um, I don't think it'll just be performing arts center. I think there'll be other pieces that come along with it. You know, we could have more hotels. We could have more housing. We could have uh, a variety of different things that are associated with it. Um, so all of that will be looked at in terms of what the city can put in. But no, the city's not going to put in $60 million. It's got to be a, a, a public-private partnership and fundraising campaign. Um, on another subject, you've just announced a new executive director of uh, Downtown mm -hmm. Lansing, Inc., yeah. the old principal shopping district. Yep. Uh, what, what, uh, why the change? What are you hoping? Uh, is there a new direction you're hoping for? What, what is this about? Um, well, the change because the former director uh, moved over to LEPFA to be, a, um, to be kind of a, a, an events person, I want to say coordinator, she's an events person, so... But why didn't she move over to LEPFA because you wanted a new director? Uh, we, we moved Silver Bells. Um, Silver Bells is now going to be run by LEPFA mm -hmm. instead of, of the DLI, and there were some events and things that, that she was is really good at. And um, she moved over there in order to continue to, to do that and other events. Um, and so this was uh, voluntary. It was, yeah. It was. We had conversations about uh, about the best fit, and 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 she really has incredible strengths with silver bells and Why events and things. Why move silver bells to Lepfa? Um, because we wanted the downtown Lansing Inc. You say DLI, it's downtown Lansing Inc. We wanted them to focus on the day to day, the you know more festivals over the weekend, working with businesses, uh, making sure that the downtown on a day to day um, is as active as it can be. Um, Silver Bells is is one incredible um, parade and festival for you know for a weekend, uh, and what Lepfa does you know Lepfa does some of those things really well. Some of those event type things you know they're doing well with Grossbeck. We thought it would be it would match better there to provide more capacity for DLI to do kind of the day to day um, and work with the businesses and talk about you know how we make our downtown active. And again, we you know we want to see. You know things like Blues Fest or Scrap Fest or you know below the stacks and all these things. We want to see more of that in our downtown. We want to see day-to-day -day capacity in terms of activities and things. Um, and Silver Bells took up a lot of time. I mean, it really did. It's, it was a it was a lot of time to get ready for it and and work on it. And um, we wanted to free up time. So um, the spot was open, and we did a we did a national search, and um, we had. We didn't do it. I take that back. DLI did it. The, the Downtown Lansing Inc. board did it. They spent a lot of time on the search. They spent a lot of time getting applications and vetting and interviewing. And they chose Kathleen Edgerly, who is the, the um, downtown director for Howell. Howell. Mm -hmm. um, and she's done a great job in Howell. She lives here in, in the Lansing area. She was working in Howell. Um, she used to work for DLI and then went to Howell. And now she's coming back. and. We're excited for for all the ideas and things that she's is going to bring. You know, for the um, for the day to day, for the you know daytime when all of our state employees are here, and nighttime so that people stay and have more to do, and weekends things going on. You know, on Washington Square and in our downtown, in addition to the stadium district, that whole footprint. We're we're excited to see um, to see what she can do. Very good. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the national search you did for that. Uh, did, did, uh, what kind of search did you do for the new police chief? You just announced uh, Daryl Green, a 22-year veteran of the force, Correct. Uh, will replace uh, Chief Yankowski. Yep. Uh, last time we talked to you, uh, when there was the possibility mm -hmm. that Chief Yankowski was going to go to Grand Rapids, you talked about maybe we should look at getting a, a headhunter like yeah. Grand Rapids used. Yep. And, and then changed my mind. Changed your mind. Okay. Changed my mind. Why, why did you do that? Because when you have the person who's the best, there's no need to spend thirty to forty thousand dollars or whatever it is to do a search when this is where you're going to land anyway. We're going to save that money. The, the guy is he's 22 years of the department. We we like having internal <clears throat> candidates and and wanted to you know to look at that first. 22 year veteran, uh, what six and a half seven year captain. He's been in every different part of the department. Has he's, a PhD. He's a PhD. He's FBI certified. He's military. He's former military and still does, yeah. I believe, Navy training. Um, the community loves him. I'm hearing but nothing but kudos. You know, he has been all over the place as we've done our walking Wednesdays and things. He's the patrol captain, so he shows up. Um, he has got a lot of support within our community, and and I heard that loud and clear. 
And, uh, and again, you know, I, I could do a national search and see, but it would waste a lot of people's time and it would waste a lot of city dollars. Very likely, you know, in my mind, for certain, ending right back where we started, which is with Daryl Green uh, becoming the next police chief. So he, 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 Now the other side of a 22-year veteran is he's, he can't be far from retirement. Right? He's, three he's, years. he's eligible in three years. Yeah, that doesn't mean he's going to retire. Have with him, what his... Uh, Long-term thoughts, sir. I have not. You know, I have not. At this point, um, you know, he he wanted the job. You know, I, my first question was, "Do you want the job?" And he wanted the job, and um, and I I respect that. You know, had he said, "I don't know, I don't know," then we'd say, "All right, you know, maybe we need to do a search." But he wanted the job, and uh, and I think he is the best person for the job. And you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say, "All right, you can have the job if you're here X number of years." He's the best person for the job, and. Um, you know, if, if he enjoys the job, if he loves the job, he'll be here for as, as long as, as, uh, as he wants to be. And he's retirement eligible in three years, but that doesn't mean he's going to retire in three years. He could. Um, you know, Yankowski was chief for, what, six years before he retired. I think the average for a chief is somewhere around five or six years. It's somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it, but he's the right person for the job. Uh, all right, I want to ask you about a bigger picture issue, uh, some bigger picture issues. First of all, on the local front, uh, the, the, what is the city going to do in this new fiscal year we're in about uh, the environmental challenge that uh, everyone is facing, uh, yeah. climate, uh, global warming and climate changes? Yep. What, 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 are, what is Lansing doing? We have, we have engaged with a, um, a person who actually works at MSU about a, a climate action plan. Now, internally, we're looking at you know, the, the city itself, uh, our buildings and things, and we're, uh, we have a company called Johnson Controls, which, was, um, which is doing a, kind of a study of our city buildings. We want to be more efficient. But climate action you know, is a bigger issue than just city buildings. And we have engaged with a consultant to do a, a climate action plan for us. And once we have that plan, we're going to do what we can to start implementing that plan. You know, there was conversation about a sustainability director when the last budget passed, and I said, I'm, I'm interested in something like that, but I want the climate action plan first. Um, so we've had conversations internally about um, can we have somebody who deals with sustainability. You know, I'm a, I'm a climate action mayor, so I'm involved with a lot of the, not a lot, I'm involved with the work that's going on nationally, you know, at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. There has been a lot of talk about climate action and what we can do. Some of it is, is smart city work, so we can track and have data and see what, we, what more we need to do. Um, so we're engaged. Um, I want to see this, this plan when it's issued, and we think it'll be you know, September, October, somewhere around there. But it's definitely an issue. You know, we're seeing a lot more flooding. We're seeing a lot more rainfall. I mean, this June, we had, what, five days that didn't have rain. Maybe that's climate. Maybe it's not. But we're seeing temperature change and, and rainfall and, and weather that we haven't seen in other years. So we're starting to see the effects, I think, of, of, uh, of climate change. And um, so we want to see what comes in this plan. We keep an eye on what's going on nationally. Um, you know, we, we, I propose that we would use renewable energy, which I thought would be a, a good idea. And, um, and that didn't happen. The, the council was not supportive. So we're instead looking at, at some of our, again, our parking garages and other things through our, um, through our enterprise funds to see if we can make some internal changes that are more efficient. You know, City Hall, of course, is the most inefficient building there is, and I'd still love to get into a new City Hall, but we talked about that. Um, so we're, we're looking at uh, what we can do as the city of Lansing government, as well as kind of this climate action change that we can work with <coughs> a variety of partners and others to implement once we see the plan. Are there things other cities are doing that you would like to do, but you literally cannot do? For example, sure. some cities are telling, uh, <laughs> say that you want a plastic bag, you got to pay more. The state of Michigan said, no, that we're not going to allow that. Yeah. Are there some really progressive ideas out there you would embrace if you could? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are lots of ideas like that, um, but we are preempted from doing most of that. Um, by the state, so yeah. a lot of that is a state legislature issue, and um, yeah, and the business community has gone to the state legislature and and asked for cities to not be able to do things like that. Um, but yeah, I think we would look at a lot of you know New York is doing things with uh, you know in the same way with plastic bags and with building emissions and things like that. That um, we would look at a lot of that, um, but 
I, we are preempted. What we do, when I, again, when I go to the Conference of Mayors, I bring back different ideas and things, and we look and see what, what we can do. And, and I'm open to, to many ideas. Um, so people are welcome to send them our way. But we, um, you know, the old adage at the US Conference of Mayors is, um, good, mayor, good mayors borrow, great mayors steal. Um, so we are always looking at what other communities are doing to see what we can do um, and what we can't do. And again, we are preempted from, from plastic bags. We are, we're preempted from a variety of things at the state, which I voted against when I was in the legislature. Um, so we, we navigate that challenge. Yeah. Speaking of bags, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we, the city is going to get rid of individual oh, yeah. bag collection. Yeah. What, what's going on there? Uh, we are going to move in the new year. We're going to move our system. We're getting rid of the the blue, um, the blue bags that you kind of you, you put in, you tie, and you put it in your front yard. Um, I use those bags and I love them, but it's not about what Andy Shore citizen loves. This is about what's good for the city. Um, they are they are messy. Um, I get more people who are like, oh, the, you know, the city is dirty and it's trash all over the place. A lot of that is people put those bags out, animals get into them, they're not tied right, and it, 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 it becomes a mess. Um, so those bags are problematic for, for trash on the ground. Um, we have worker injuries, so our workers, um, sometimes they lift the bags and they're too heavy. Sometimes, more often than not in the winter, when they get out of the trucks to lift the bags, we have slip and fall accidents. and. Um, you know, it's, it's a workers' comp issue for the city, but this is also, you know, employees are, are getting injured. And we've got numbers on that. Um, so what we wanted to do, uh, and it took some time because we had to work through the plan, we wanted to, to have people use the bins because the bins, you put the trash in, you roll it out, um, the trash, the garbage truck comes, grabs the bin and dumps it, and you don't have the worker injury, you don't have the trash getting out. Um, we also, we have no way to know who's putting a trash bag out or when, because you go to your local store, you buy the trash bag, you put it out. We have to send trucks down every road because we don't know who's putting them out or not. With the bins, you have to get it from the city and pay quarterly, so we know where the bins are. So if there's a street with no bins, mm -hmm. we don't have to go down that street. So now that's saving the roads because you're not beating them up with a garbage truck. You know, it's saving on gas, it's saving the environment because it's less pollution because the truck has to go down less roads. Um, so we think that'll be a benefit. Now, the one concern I did have was, you know, moving to the bin, the bins are expensive. Um, they're more expensive than a trash bag. Um, the average citizen puts out 1.5 1, 1 bags a week, but there are people like me, right, who I put it out every other week. So now I'm paying for every week, even though I'm, um, I'm only putting it out every other week. Um, so we wanted to have a more affordable option. So we said anybody who's getting the smallest bin, the 32 ounce bin, can now put it out every other week um, and they will pay half the price. So it is a much more affordable option. Instead of paying $44 a quarter for every week, if you want to put it out every other week, you'll pay $22 a quarter. And that is, it's just slight increase from those who are doing the bags. So we made an affordable option. We already have a, a kind of a low income option that we use now that continues and those people will get that option. So we're using the, the bins, we're making it um, more affordable by having the every other week option. People can use the bags um, through the end of the year. Um, the, these stores will still have them through the end of the year, but they're hard to get now. Um, so, uh, and then if you move to the bins and you've been using bags in your first quarter, you're getting a discount. So we're trying to make it affordable. We're trying to make it better for, for the environment and cleaner, help the workers. Um, and this is not, this is something that many other communities have done. If people truly love the bags and just want to use the bags, then Granger still offers what are called bag tags. Um, so they will, if you if you want to contract with Granger instead of paying the city, you can contract with Granger and get your bag tag. Again, I don't love that because people take the thinnest, you know, the thinnest garbage bag. They put a bag tag on it, and it, again, could right. be messy. But they still have that option. Okay, so now you brought up Granger. So what we have is uh, two uh, collection uh, operations going on here. Mm -hmm. That it seems pretty bad for the roads. It is. Well, why, why not just either give in to Granger or say Granger can't come in the city? We'll, we'll look at that into the future. It, we want to see, we want to see first how, what this new system does if it reduces the strain on the roads in addition to all the other benefits I talked about. You know, it's, we are, we're looking at all options. I mean, you could, you could contract it out. We can't say Granger. Um, we could contract it out and say the city's getting out of the business, but you know, we, we collect and people like that right now and, and we've got employee contracts and things like that. 
that, uh, that outsourcing it, um, we'd have to navigate that with, employee, uh, with our employees and contracts and things with our unions. Um, we could say the city will only collect and nobody else will, but now we're taking over a service that we have um, actually more than one, we have uh, more than one private company that, that can do it. So we're looking at that. I mean, I, I want to see um, what's the best option. We've got the garbage trucks right now, so you know, do we continue, do we get out? I, at this point, we want to get rid of the bags and go to bins and make it affordable and see does that help out with all of these things that we think it will. Um, and then, you know, we're, I'm not, I'm open to everything in the future. We just, I don't know where the future holds just yet. Now, some cities are finding <laughs> that single stream recycling is proving to be costly. Uh, has Lansing run into that? Because you spend so much time yeah. separating the stuff. We haven't. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't. We, now we are, um, we put out a contract for a, a MRF, a Michigan, it's, we put out a contract for a recycler. We had been using a company, the cost went way high. Um, you know, this has to do with sending these materials to China and they used to go to China and then they would pay for it and now they won't. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the waste, the recycling stream is, is fascinating how, how we actually sell it to people who buy the different pieces. Um, we did have a, again, we had a company that would, that would take it and we would tip it and they would take it and then they would do the separation and they would sell the materials and make money, but they started charging us more. So we are, uh, in essence, getting out of that and working with a company called Mterra, who uh, is going to take property in Lansing and build a recycling facility that would separate. Oh. Um, now there's, there's conditions, we're working with East Lansing on this, um, and we would both send our recycling there. We, you know, we have to send a certain amount and, and we think we will be able to do that. You have to have a certain contamination level. It's got to be under a certain percentage. Right now, it's going to Ann Arbor. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we send it to Ann Arbor. I think that's right. So it'll stay here mm -hmm. and be separated. Um, and again, our contamination level is under what the what the the limit would be. Contamination, for those who don't know, you know, if you if you throw trash in your recycling bin, when that gets separated out, it, it doesn't get separated out as a, as a material to be sold. It gets separated out as contamination. But our contamination level is actually fairly low. Um, I want to say it's five or six percent, and that's under the, say, ten percent or so. That's the the standard. Um, but again, they were sending. They, everybody in the U.S. was sending recycling to China. They were buying it, and I guess they reduced their contamination level to like one percent. So now people can't send it there because it's too low. So this is communities all over the country are going through this right now. And you mentioned that. You mentioned you know communities are looking at their single stream. So this is being looked at everywhere. But you know, in my opinion, the citizens of Lansing, citizens of Lansing, they like the single stream. You know, I remember before single stream, I had a drawer in my uh, in my house out in Sycamore Park, um, where you know we put the newspapers on one side, and we'd put the the bottles in the middle, and we put the you know all the different recyclings, and and you'd have to put them out separately. People like being able to put it all into one receptacle, put it in their single stream put it out and, and have it recycled, and it's, it's increasing the, the numbers of recycling, percentages of recycling, so we like that. Uh, another environmental issue is uh, the new uh, BWL plant. Mm -hmm. uh, some environmentalists have argued that uh, at one time natural gas, which the new plant will be <laughs> without coal, was a big step in the right direction, but uh, they can see now that uh, we're close enough to other uh, forms, uh, wind and solar, uh, that natural gas, which is not the cleanest form of um, energy, uh, is going to be passe uh, before this plant has fulfilled its useful life. Uh, any thoughts on that? You know, this is, this is not new. This has been an issue for months and months. We do not have, we, we, are, we are getting out of the coal business. Coal is dirty. Coal is terrible for the environment. We are getting out of the coal business, and we do not have the capacity right now um, for, uh, for wind and solar in Michigan. Um, we don't have it. We cannot reliably keep the power on in everybody's house without charging very, very large rate increases with what we have. So the option that we have is building probably the very last natural gas plant. Now, yes, it's, you know, this is a 30, 40, or 30 year, I think it's 30 year, um, repayment, so we will have that operating. I know there was a, someone in, in the city pulse who said that you know it, it may not operate 30 years, and if it doesn't, 
it doesn't, um, but we need to have sustainability. We need to, I mean, I had somebody tell me, oh, people would pay $8,000 more a year if it's just um, natural, if, it's, if, it's, if we don't have a plant. I don't think that's true. I don't think people will pay $8,000 more in the year. And I don't even know if that's the number. I don't know where he got that number from. Um, people expect when they turn their power on, they turn their lights on to have lights. And, and I remember the ice storm, and I remember being out for you know, seven to 10 days. They expect reliability, they expect affordability, um, and they want it to be environmentally sound. So we're getting out of the coal business. The Board of Water and Lights getting out of the coal business. Again, they're building probably the last plant they will build, but is a natural gas plant, which is much cleaner than coal. Um, and they've got the renewable power option that people can utilize renewable um, power, which again, they've got to buy that. They're out in, in Tuscola County and in Gratiot County trying to buy those resources. But you know, people in Tuscola and people out on the coast, they don't want the windmills in their backyard. You see a lot of nimbyism. So it's very difficult to, to get power within the state. Without a power plant, we'd have to, to buy from, from out of state, and we would be subject to whatever they decide to charge. Um, so you know, the example people always give me is in LA, they were going to do a plant, and now they're not. Well, in LA, they've got sun a lot longer than we do here in Michigan. You know, they've got sun 12 months of the year, and we don't. Um, we've got wind capacity, and, and you're seeing those turbines go up wherever we can, but there's still not enough there. Um, we've got solar capacity. Uh, I don't know what our hydro capacity is. But we just don't, from the, all the numbers that I have seen, we don't, it's getting better. Yes, it's getting better somewhat, but we don't have the capacity to provide that for our service area. And, and um, I'm not interested in a huge rate hike. So um, we'll have the plant and it's already in process. And I mean, if it shuts down early and, it's, and we can pay for it with the rates that we have, then it shuts down early. But um, at this point, that's the last plant that we expect to see built. And, um, people will continue to have an affordable option that is reliable when they turn that switch on. All right. So I want to turn to some political uh, sure. topics before we go. First yeah. of all, uh, uh, shortly we'll have the uh, city primary on four of uh, the eight city council seats. Yes. Uh, are you still uh, happy with uh, whatever uh, results are? Yeah, I haven't, you know, I haven't endorsed the primaries coming up. Um, when the primary happens, I believe the, there's five at-large candidates, so one will not move forward and the other four will. Uh, I want to say there's four or five first ward candidates and, uh, and two of them will move forward. Um, and then Councilman Hussein in the third ward is unopposed and I have not heard of any write-in or anything like that. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the campaign just like everybody else. Um, not seeing a lot of yard signs and things like that. I've seen quite a few for Jody Washington. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I the incumbent I, in the first ward. Yep. I have seen some for Jody. I've seen some for a few of her opponents. Scott Hughes has some. Uh, out I've there. seen Scott Hughes. I've seen James Pyle. Um, I have seen Brandon Betts. I think those are the ones that mm -hmm. I've seen in the first ward. Um, you know, I've seen at large. I've seen for uh, for Yanis Jackson Long. I, I've seen for Julie Rodiker. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen for Carol, but I know she's I know she's campaigning. I've seen the you know the the literature. Uh, I know Pat Patricia Spitzley is campaigning. Um, so both of the incumbents are are campaigning. So, uh, you know, I don't even know if I've gotten a piece of lit at my house yet. I um, haven't seen it. So you know, I, I assume that and I'm not in the first ward, which is where you know I'm in in the uh, in the fourth ward. So. I'm just I'm keeping an eye on it. Again, they're they're all I work very very well with all of them right now, and and haven't endorsed, and they all know that. And uh, we'll see what happens after the primary. I'm curious to see how things move forward after the primary, and I'll I'll, I'll closely keep an eye on it. Next week is uh, the uh, next uh, Democratic debate in Detroit. In Detroit. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Yeah. Um, your position in the past has been you, you'd like to see a governor or a mayor. Uh, any thoughts? I, I, going still, I mean, I still like someone with an executive experience, and many of them have it. When I say a governor or mayor, that's 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 sort of true. You know, uh, you know, I said I like Cory Booker, who's a senator, but he's right. a former oh, mayor right. of uh, of Newark. I do like Kamala Harris, and she is a former prosecutor. Mm -hmm. She wasn't a mayor or a governor, but she's got executive experience, you know, leading a, a, a bigger department. Um, you know, I, Joe Biden has, has executive experience being vice president and being part of that. So I like those with executive experience, and I have concerns about just, a, you know, someone whose whole experience is as a legislator. 
Uh, and again, I'm a former legislator, and I moved from a legislator into the mayor's job, and I can tell you it's, it's, a, very different, um, it's a very different experience. So, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how they all do. I got invited to the debate, but I can't go. Uh, I've got stuff both days right until you know, eight or nine or eight or nine o'clock. And then, you know, I'm hoping to get oh, home to watch bad. the debate. Um, but yeah, it was, it was nice. I, you know, I, I appreciate the invitation, you know, our Congresswoman uh, reached out and I appreciate uh, the invitation, um, but I can't make it. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to switch around things to drive an hour and a half to Detroit to see the debate and drive an hour and a half back. I'll, I'll watch it on TV and, um, and that'll be just as, as good as anybody else. Back in, uh, I think, 75, 76, rather, I covered the famous Ford-Carter debate where the power went out right, right, minutes right. before the end, and they stood there and literally said nothing to each other for 18 minutes as we all watched them. They just stood That's uncomfortable. stared straight ahead. Well, I was, I was one at the time, so I don't remember this, <laughs> but, uh, but that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, Finally, I wanted to ask you a, a question that I'm sure the candidates will be asked uh, next week, which is, what do we do about this dilemma Democrats have in the House of Representatives whether to proceed with an impeachment inquiry? What's your gut? Um, I mean, my gut is from, from previous impeachments, they, they take a long time. Um, you have to, to do your due diligence within the House, um, the Senate, if the House passes it, the Senate would have to do, you know, a conviction. Um, my gut is, it wouldn't finish until the election, um, and whether it was successful or not, if he gets reelected, he's the next president. Whether he gets impeached or not, so I, my gut is, um, is the time it would take, and the the kind of the resources and and the time away from other things, with it just to end at the exact same time as the election. Um, I don't know if the timing lines up. But uh, but I'm not there. I mean, I'm you, not. What do you think the the reception would be among voters? I don't know. I, it depends on who the voter is. Some you know some voters, some voters would be upset. Some voters would be very happy. And I think some voters would think it's it's a waste of time in D.C. Um, I mean, it would see it would be seen as a very. Um, I think people would see it as as. A, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I mean, I remember, I, clearly I remember when, when Clinton went through it, and I think people saw it more as, as vengeful than real. I mean, there were, there were issues that were raised, and some people, you know, wanted him to be impeached for it, and some people yeah. didn't. But, I, it, you know, it, again, it sucks a lot of air out of the room um, when the other things could be focused on. And um, I don't know. I, again, I, I don't think there's one standard thing voters would think. I think some people would be very happy. And I think some people would be very upset, and I think some people would think it's a waste of time. Um, There's also, I think, a legitimate concern among uh, members of the House, such as the 8th District mm -hmm. Representative, uh, uh, Alyssa Slotkin, because, uh, you know, she's the first Republican, uh, first Democrat, Democrat in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get elected in a district that's decidedly Republican, yeah. and uh, yeah, there are a lot. And, I mean, there are a lot of districts where there are yeah, a lot of districts it could where, cost, where uh, the Democrats the House. It could. Yeah. I mean, it, there are a lot of districts that that Democrats won, and they campaigned on we're going to get in there and we're going to do policy and we're not, you know, we're going to be moderates and work both sides. And and um, and Alyssa has done a great job of that. She has done a great job of taking issues as they come. You know, we have worked with her on a variety of things, priorities for the Conference of Mayors, um, priorities for Lansing. And, you know, I, again, I think she wants to focus her time on, on getting things done. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a very political, what could be seen as a partisan effort, um, it, it can hurt those, what is it, 30, 40 House seats that, that Democrats won. It, it could. But, again, you know, some people in the party believe that you do, that they will do what they believe is right. And some people in the party believe that, um, that they should focus on other things. So it's, it's within every party, with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, you have that calculation. Um, and the Democrats in D.C. are going through that. And honestly, I'm, I'm thrilled I'm not a Democrat in Congress. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to be mayor of Lansing. So anytime anybody asks me, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be the mayor of Lansing and I'll let D.C be it, you know, be D.C., and, and we're going to do the right things for the city of Lansing here, and I'm, I'm thrilled to do that and not be in D.C. All right, and before, uh, finally, before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to put to rest 
a rumor uh, uh, that somebody put in writing to me anonymously, which is you're, f you're flying to a lot of uh, <laughs> places like Hawaii first class. So first of all, how <laughs> often are you traveling? And secondly, how do you, when you travel, how do you fly? Let me take a second one first, um, and, and we've had this conversation. Uh, when I fly, I fly the base coach. You know, if it's taxpayer, if it's taxpayer dollars, um, which um, it, it's base coach. So we actually, I told you the story uh, last year or, or in February, I was going to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and um, in Washington, in Washington, and uh, and the flight got canceled that night because of snow and they couldn't take off. And I was talking to the woman at the desk and I said, I need to, to, to reschedule to go out tomorrow. And she looked at it and she laughed and she said, she said, aren't you the mayor? And I said, yeah. She said, you're flying base coach, not even like coach, you're flying base <laughs> coach. She said, you're the mayor, why are you flying base coach? And I said, because because I'm the mayor. I said, well, right, right. I said, because it's taxpayer dollars and I'm the mayor and, and, uh, and I don't, you know, that's how I would fly. Um, now I, I travel a few, you know, a few times a year. Um, it just it depends. I'm on the accelerator for America Board, which we're dealing with Opportunity Zones, and they have, I want to say, two meetings a year, um, and they pay for me to go, and I still fly coach. Right. Um, uh, I, um, you know, the National League of Cities had a had a legacy uh, conference with five legacy cities, and we actually got a grant from from them. And I went out to Denver for that a few months ago. Um, you were just in Hawaii, it was that I, city you, yeah, business? It was, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Yeah. The U.S. Conference of Mayors, so they had their, every year they have their D.C. event in February or March, and then they have their um, annual event um, in, uh, at the back end of the summer. So last year it was in Boston and I didn't go. Um, we had something else. This year it was in Hawaii because it was the anniversary of President Kennedy giving his speech to the U.S. Conference of Mayors in 63. So they had Caroline Kennedy was there and they, they were in Hawaii. Um, and I mean, I, I, was, I was in the Hilton Hawaiian Village and I was in the hotel, you know, from, from 7 a.m. until, you know, 5, 5.30 p.m. And then we did get to go to Pearl Harbor that night. The mayors were all brought to Pearl Harbor one night. Um, and one night we got to go to the Iolani Palace for an hour. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was there for a conference. And um, I've also had some people ask me, why doesn't he announce that he's going on a trip? What, why um, is that? I don't. I don't hide it. We did. Uh, we did media when we were there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. But the, uh, you, I don't know. You've expressed some. I, I hope I'm not giving something. Oh. You expressed some concern about uh, your the safety of your house. Yes. Yes. I, I don't. Yes. I mean, there's <laughs> there is there are safety concerns. You know, for for my family. For for you know our, our property and things like that, um, you know I I don't shy away from it. But um, but when we went again, I was I was interviewed by um, by a TV station in Hawaii, and they sent it to one of the TV stations here. We didn't hide it. Um, we just you know I, I don't know I, I I I go I I'm traveling all the time within the city. You know if I'm not in City Hall, I'm thrilled. If I get to go to you know this event or that event. Um, I'm going to be in Grand Rapids in a few months because I was asked to be on a mayor's panel. I do stuff with the Michigan Municipal League when I can, but most of those are meeting in Lansing. Um, I'm in Detroit from time to time. Um, again, I, had, I, got, I got invited to the debate, but I'm not going. Um, I don't know. It's just, right. you know, I, I, I'm happy to do my part on behalf of the city of Lansing. When I went out to the conference last time, we came back with a $10,000 grant. Um, so I, I do my best to, to pitch Lansing as a great place and, and spread the word. And it's working. I got put on this accelerator for America board, um, which is incredible with the mayor of LA, and, and it's working. We are increasing the capacity of Lansing and bringing back to the city. Very good. So to whoever wrote me anonymously, <laughs> there, there it is. Uh, <laughs> if you have proof otherwise, uh, write me again. Yeah, I'd love to know. I got, I, I got upgraded once to Comfort Plus, but, if they, <laughs> but they put me in the middle, and I hated it. They put me in the middle. Oh. I like being on an end, so that's, that's it. The Comfort Plus once, I promise. All right, very good, uh, Your Honor. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you in September. Thanks, Burl. All right. Thanks for uh, watching again from Message Makers Studio. On behalf of City Pulse, I'm Burl Schwartz.